Sadek, uh, uh, when we first got on the chat, you were mentioning your uh, your coronavirus um, quarantine Passover. How? Uh, but I I didn't hear how it was. What? It, how did it you didn't exist. celebrate? I uh, my 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 brother's in another state, and my mother uh, doesn't have any concept of technology due to her age. Um, so she was. She's in uh, her apartment, which luckily is a few blocks from where I live. And it was just me. And I, mm -hmm. to be quite honest, I, the only Seder experience I had was hearing other people's Seders through my apartment window. Mm -hmm. Sadik, where do you That's live? That's it. I'm where on the Upper live? West Side. I'm on, on the Upper West Side. Okay. So there's, my building is like... Uh, I would say 50% Jewish. So I heard through the windows in my apartment, different staters going on with, you know, and it's all it's mostly young people. So that was it. How about you, Joan? How was your, how was your, oh, it, was, it was highly amusing. We were in six homes in four cities in two countries. And, um, it worked, it did work. What was really fun was the dinner break when everybody brought their food to their respective tables. And there was a long discussion of where did you get it and how did you get it and how did you cook it and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But it worked, the whole thing worked. Mm -hmm. It oh, wasn't good. ideal, it wasn't perfect, but you know, the idea is to be together. Right. Well, uh, speaking of being together, uh, I wanna thank everyone for joining us. We have 18 people on the call now. Um, and also hopefully some people watching on the live stream. We're gonna get underway with the lecture very shortly. Um, uh, just a little bit of housekeeping before we start. So if you're new to this, as I think most of us are, um, you have um, the option to uh, send us um, questions or comments by chat. Uh, even while your microphone is muted, you can, uh, you can do that. And if you have a technical question, you'll see that there's also an account called IT support, um, uh, which you can um, chat privately if you have a question um, about, uh, about connecting. Um, and um, if you have a question, I encourage you to, to write it into the chat and um, uh, our staff will be monitoring it and hopefully we can feed those questions to Sadiq at the end. And at, at five minutes uh, after, 3 p.m. I think we should get started. Um, so I want to welcome everyone again. Uh, thanks for tuning in to uh, LBI's first uh, virtual pop-up exhibition and uh, Passover related Judaica antique roadshow. Um, we're with, we're going to hear from Sadek Kaplan today, um, a, an appraiser and curator uh, from New York City, who had put together a fascinating pop-up exhibition for us uh, that we were going to show in a case at the Center for Jewish History during the holiday. Um, uh, and, and of course, um, that was canceled. But uh, luckily, we have pictures of all the objects. And um, Zadik's going to just briefly uh, talk us through them, a little bit about their history, their significance, and um, probably some stories about how he happened to acquire them. And then we're going to see uh, some of your Passover related Judaica and hear from Sadek about what he can discern, discern about um, uh, its uh, origins uh, and significance and, and maybe even its value. Um, uh, and um, we thank you all for being here. I'm going to turn things over to Sadek and Sadek, um, when you want me to switch to the next slide, just ask me to do so and I'll do that. Okay. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you everybody for coming. Happy Passover. Um, so the exhibit that was supposed to go up was German items for Pesach or German related where it, it is maybe perhaps in a neighboring country, which I put together for my own collection. So the first slide are two pieces that I do not own. These are made out of a type of porcelain called Fayence from Strasbourg, France. Uh, Strasbourg is the capital city of Alsace-Lorraine and Jews there spoke 
uh, a German dialect that was influenced by French. So these date to late 18th, early 19th century. Um, they're not particularly rare. They appear from time to time on the market. Various Jewish museums around the world own a bowl or plate. But when I saw a certain item come on the market, uh, next slide, please, David. So when I saw one? this item, this this soup terrain, where both the body and the lid is marked for Passover, I, I found it uh, very charming and most unusual. And I actually purchased it directly from a, and that was over a decade ago. And I'm not aware of any other examples of, um, of a, of a terrine of this type of uh, faience ware from Strasbourg. And uh, it's in very poor condition. Both handles are gone. On one side, there's an old repair using metal staples, which is, I guess, how they repaired uh, pieces of, ceramic slash porcelain over a hundred years ago, maybe more. And this dates to about 1790. Uh, next slide, please. This is a pewter dish for Passover. This is also from Strasbourg. Uh, I know it to be from there because uh, apparently this is one of uh, about two dozen similar pewter plates known for Passover that are decora decorated in, in uh, similar ways. Uh, there are examples that are in French museums and in the collection of the Israel Museum in Jerusalem and in private collections. Uh, they differ in terms of size and quality. Uh, this is the most elaborate example I have seen where you have a family sitting down to dinner with their four children, have service, and Dagada, and around it are various scenes from the Torah itself, and even, even from uh, beyond the Torah, Tanakh. If you go to the next slide, you'll see a better photo. No, nope. Should be one right after that that's a close-up. Hmm. Oh, you, uh, this is not the updated PowerPoint, David. Oh, I'm sorry, hold on a second. I switched to the wrong one when... Uh... Yeah, that's the test. Right, right. That's it. Uh, nope, that's still the old one. Never mind. I think the file is marked final, F-I-N-A-L. Hmm. Um, let's see here. Thanks, David. Can you see David it now? There. there we go. Sorry about that.
Can everyone see it? We can see the first slide. Hmm. Okay, just a just a moment. There we go. All right, that's it. Okay, back to our regularly scheduled program. Um, so you'll see in the center, the uh, scene I was describing where it's four stunts and you could even make out the shank bone, the egg, the bitter herb. And if you look from on your right side of the screen going towards the left, you'll see Adam and Eve with the snake, your uh, sacrifice of Isaac, Noah's Ark, um, that's the spies returning from Canaan with the grapes, and Haman hanging in the gallows. Very, very elaborate example of this Strasbourg uh, pewter plate. This dates to the early 19th century, anywhere between 1800 and 1830 or so. Uh, next. So I don't collect uh, books primarily. It's I'm, I'm an objects guy, and this is uh, this is not uh, in my collection, but it relates to something coming up next. This is uh, there was a, a a custom in the 18th and 19th centuries in countries like Germany, uh, Italy, the Netherlands to have a scribe make a small little miniature book of the counting of the Omer, which is the 49 days that you're supposed to count starting from Passover until the holiday of Shavuos. And this is a typical example. Uh, you can see how small it is by the person's fingers holding it. So this is not something I would ever acquire. But when I saw this, next slide. I really was uh, really taken aback. It's a, it only stands four inches high, and it, the scroll itself is a half an inch wide. And there are little knobs to turn the scroll to the appropriate day. And it's got a beautiful patina. It's very, very charming. And my area of expertise is not Hebrew manuscripts. So I really had no idea where, if there was any significance to the, the way the letters are done but the wood looked fairly old. And so I consulted a Hebrew manuscripts expert. If you can go to the next slide. And this is a close up of the lettering and was told there is absolutely nothing remarkable about these letters. It's typical for 18th and 19th century Europe. So I focused back on the case and what I soon learned is that the type of wood used here is likely from Germany because woods used in Poland and the Ukraine that are found in Jewish objects are usually a fruit wood, sometimes referred as sandal wood. Uh, this is not. So this case, it's, this case likely hails from Germany just based on the case, probably dates to the early, early 19th century. I'm not aware of any Omer calendars um, that are freestanding that are this small. There are, uh, there are ones that are actually quite large that are in various museums and some are a bit small, but this is particularly small. And it's just, it's just so charming. And I think personally it was not used, not made as an, an amusement piece to be put on a desk, but probably for traveling maybe by a, by a merchant. Uh, next slide. So these are small little porcelain dishes uh, with gold paint. And you can see the center, each dish has a different uh, word for the foodstuffs to be placed on the Seder tray, uh, hand painted. There are no hallmarks on the dishes. So when I acquired them, I did not have any clue where in Europe they might be from. 
It's just, it, they appeared European, but specifically where in Europe, it could have been anywhere. Um, but when I came across this, next slide. This is from the Israel Museum in Jerusalem. And you'll see the uh, larger cup has lettering that is strikingly similar, hand painted as to the ones on my dishes. And the museum has determined that this dates to the 19th century from Germany. So I think it's really safe to assume that my dishes are also from Germany. If you compare the lettering, next slide. It's really, it's really quite similar. Um, I'm not saying that the same artist did it, but the style, it's, uh, if that's German from the Israel Museum, then, then these are likely to be German as well, which is interesting and, and makes sense because painted porcelain dishes would only date, would only hail from Germany or Hungary and Ukrainian Hebrew does not really look like this exactly, so. It is likely from German. Next. Here's another pewter uh, dish for Pesach. The center has a scene of buildings behind a brick wall. This likely refers to Jerusalem because of the, uh, the uh, last words we say during the the Seder service, next you're in. Next. So we all know that there's a famous verse in Haggadah where the, it goes, Rabbi Gamliel used to say, these three things are what you have to teach to learn about the holiday, Passover, Matzah, and Marar. So the engraver wanted to fit the whole verse, but he didn't have room. So he put the first letter of every word of that stanza, uh, made it large, and then above it, in very small lettering, he wrote the entire word uh, above it. So like for Aleph, it says Amar, Reish, Rabban, Gimel, Gamliel, et cetera, et cetera. Very, very, really unusual. And you'll see why he, he wanted to limit the text here by abbreviation because if you go to the next slide. So the end of the verse is supposed to teach Pesach, which is the Paschal lamb. And here we have a shepherd with the shepherd's crook holding the lamb. Because, uh, uh, and next. Matzah. And here you have a gentleman holding a matzah. And finally, Moror and a, and a gentleman holding uh, the bitter herb. Uh, based on what I know of uh, pewter, uh, decorated pewter plates for Passover, uh, this likely hails from Bohemia, which is the modern day Czech Republic, because you'll see similarly decorated plates uh, in, in the uh, Prague Museum. And uh, I, I, would, I would really say this likely, date, likely hails from Bohemia, probably late 18th century. Next. So here's another Seder plate I own. It really doesn't get better than this when it comes to engraved pewter plates for Passover from Europe. Uh, you'll see again the center, the man on the right is holding a matzah and a moror, and titled as such, while the man on the left is holding uh, a, a lamb on a leash and a butcher's knife. And then there are verses around this relating to Passover. And then on the shallow rim of the bowl is the entire Chad Gadya nursery rhyme that we recite at the end, all illustrated. And then on the rim is another verse in Hebrew engraved for Passover. And if this was the plate, the end of the decoration would be a very, very phenomenal plate. 
just the best you can you can any museum could hope for. But what's really interesting is the next slide. So this is the reverse of the plate. It's incredibly, it's engraved as well. Uh, the rim has a verse relating to uh, celebrating Pesach, but what's interesting is the center uh, inscription, which says, Ein varf zubo min chazan leprat katan. So, what's Ein varf? Sounds like Yiddish. But it's not Yiddish, so I'll I'll, I'll uh, translate the rest. Zu bo min chazan from the cantor, and leprat katan means the in order of the small counting, which means you should add up the numerical value of all the Hebrew characters to arrive at the date this was engraved, because every Hebrew letter has a numerical value. So when you write up all the characters, it uh, comes out to 1775. But what is Einvar? I don't know Yiddish. I assumed it was Yiddish. It's not Yiddish. I found out it's Old German. And it's one word, Einvar, which means wedding gift. So this was a wedding gift from the cantor. And there was a tradition in, in uh, Central Europe to give specifically pewter Seder plates as a wedding gift to, to the newlyweds. So it's really a really fascinating piece for two reasons. Number one, the engraved reverse, which is just mind boggling. I, I'm never, I, I am aware of no other pewter plates where the reverse is engraved. And number two, the, the, the usage of German in the inscription as sp uh, spelled out with Hebrew characters. It's just fantastic and very, very interesting historically. And so it's from Germany, 1775. Uh, next. So this is a Torah art curtain, as we all know. I'm showing it to illustrate the, the item uh, coming up after this. Torah art curtains, Torah mantles, other items for the other textiles for the synagogue in, in Europe were generally made using metallic thread on velvet. Uh, the term for this is called Spiner Arbeit, which is means Spanish work because it's thought that uh, Jews fleeing Inquisition, Inquisition era Spain uh, mastered this technique and took it with them when they uh, fled to Europe. And it's a, uh, specifically a Jewish skill, it's thought to be, of sewing metallic threads on velvet. And it's found in uh, mainly in Torah textiles. But when I saw this item appear, next. I didn't recall seeing this this technique used on a matzah cover. I've seen matzah covers where some metallic thread was used in, alongside embroidery, but this is entirely metallic thread on velvet, just like you would find on a, on a uh, textile used in the synagogue. But what's really charming, as some of you might recognize, is first is the verse, Seich Litzia Mitzrayim, you should remember the Exodus from Egypt, but if you you see, if you notice something, it imitates the Seder tray itself. So all those circles have the first Hebrew letter in the food stuff put on the tray. So the center has a mem for moror, bitter herb. There's a zayin at top for zroa. There's the bet for beitza for the egg. There's the chet for charoset and chazeret. So it's really, really really lovely, where the matzah cover <laughs> imitates the Seder tray. And I, I haven't seen any other Pesach textiles where it's utilizing this technique generally found in textiles for the synagogue. Now, where is it from? It's really difficult to say. It could be anywhere in Europe where this technique was used, which is Germany, Poland, Hungary, Romania, Yugoslavia, uh, Ukraine. So 
it looks like to me that it's likely from Poland, but it could it could very well be from any of those other countries. I just as of now, I have no other way to to identify where it's from exactly. It probably dates to the late 19th century. Next. This is your typical uh, technique of, of a matzah cover. This is needlepoint. And I actually got this directly from Hungary, so I know it's Hungarian. You'll find pieces like this from Hungary and Romania. This dates to 1900 to 1920. Next. Why not Italy? Uh, Italian textiles don't look like that in needlepoint, as far as I know. Judaica textiles, no. It might have the color scheme that might have that might have been blue, but uh, the square square shaped matzo covers, matzo holders. It's you don't really don't find it that shape and that and that the the the, top, the font of the letters it doesn't really add up to Italy and I happen to have gotten it directly from Hungary. But thank you for asking. Uh, so these obviously have nothing to do with with Passover. These are figures made by the Hagenauer firm in Vienna during the 1920s. It incorporates an outgrowth of the artistic style Jugendstil, where it's simplified lines, elongated lines. It's like the German version of Art Nouveau, but more tempered. And this is what was the height of fashion uh, in the decorative arts uh, during the 1920s. These would have been very expensive to purchase at the time. Um, and these are from the 1920s from Vienna, but I'm showing it because it kind of, I think, relates to the next slide. Next. So this is a page from a Haggadah I own. Uh, like I said, I don't really buy uh, books, but I, when I first saw this, I was just taken aback by the illustrations. It's a Haggadah printed in Berlin in 1927 and illustrated by Otto Geismar. He was a art teacher in a school, in a Jewish school in Berlin. And you can see the, the wonderful stick figure representations and the, the way the 10 plagues are done. And these elongated forms is kind of relates to what was going on in, uh, in, uh, in Jugendstil, uh, the, the tempered Art Nouveau of Germany and, and Austria at the time, like I, how it relates to the objects I showed before. And next slide. This is my favorite illustration in the Haggadah. This is the end. So you see the figure on the right. He has the Haggadah up. He's reciting from it. He has a beard. And I, but as we all know, sometimes the Seder goes well past midnight. Sometimes younger people are a little tired. And you can see the, the young person, there's no gender available, but he's wearing a yarmulke, so maybe he is a male, uh, is, is out cold. His head is on his arm and he's done for the night. I love this illustration. Next. Here we have a porcelain, a white porcelain dish that was hand painted. You can see the center scene is of a Egyptian taskmaster. And there are the, the Hebrews making the bricks with a related verse. Uh, from the Torah relating to slavery. And there are then outer, the outer rim is, is painted with palm trees and various desert, desert scenes. And from just from the lettering itself, you could see it's very angular and bold. And this is the type of Hebrew lettering that was in fashion during the 1930s in, in Israel, uh, where it's very Art Deco inspired. So Looking at this dish, just from the lettering, I would say this was probably made sometime during the 1930s. Uh, 
where I wouldn't know. But luckily, next slide. This is the reverse, and the reverse tells the whole story. The center of the tray is marked with a porcelain mark for a factory in Germany and dated 1934. And the artist herself, a woman named Ruth Hada, uh, signed her name along with February 1936. So we know who painted this dish and exactly when. And if you, if you know your history, which I'm sure everybody does, uh, this is only a few months after the Nuremberg laws were passed in Germany. So it's, it, it makes it all the more poignant when you realize at what period in time in Germany this scene of, for this dish for, pay, for a Pesach. Uh, I actually got this from a dealer who picked it up at the Jaffa flea market in Israel. So when I, so probably this woman survived and brought it with her to, to Israel before the war, as many German Jews fled, fled for Palestine before the war. So hopefully she survived and maybe her descendants did not want it and it was discarded. And next. And this is the final item. Uh, this is a green ceramic tray made in the displaced persons camp of Farnwald, which is near Munich in 1948. This was issued by the joint, uh, also known as the uh, AJDC, the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, which uh, uh, made and distributed many kinds of Germ uh, Jewish articles for Jews, uh, uh, prayer books, Torahs, uh, uh, Talises, and including this tray. And we can see it's a Seder tray, obviously, but what's really poignant is the bottom, where it says, instead of the last words of the uh, Passover service where we know next year in Jerusalem, here it says, B'Shana Hazot B'Yerushalayim, this year in Jerusalem. Very, very moving. Um, and that's it. These are some of the items I wanted to share related to Passover that are related to Germany in some respect. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> thank you so much, Sadiq. Um, uh, that was really fascinating. And I want to um, uh, turn, it, turn it to the audience for questions um, while we have this slide show up, just in case there are any questions about sure. the objects you already presented. Um, and I see we had one from the chat um, from Amanda Minsky, um, who asked about I'm going to unmute her so she can tell us um, which item it was. She was asking how you knew it was from Poland. Sure. Um, Amanda, are you there? I am. Thank you. This was awesome. Um, I believe it was the dark red one, the circular. You, you said you didn't know exactly where it was from, but you said most likely Poland. So why do you think it's from Poland? Uh, when you look, I was comparing the way the letters are done and the decoration itself, it wasn't particularly fine metallic thread on velvet. So the best examples that I've seen of metallic thread on velvet is done in Prague, Bohemia, Moravia, Czech Republic. I kind of, and I kind of got, just got the feeling from textiles I've seen that are related to the Torah that are done in this method. It reminded me of Polish synagogue textiles, but absolutely, it could be really from anywhere. It could very likely be from Hungary, Austro-Hungarian Empire, Austria, Galicia. I really have no clue, but I just, I've been in this field for a quarter of a century. I just had a, I have a kind of a gut reaction that it probably, it probably hails from Poland, but I have no idea. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't this one. It was the circular one. Yeah, this was just an example of one I wanted oh, to show. Okay. What, but if you want to, David, if you want to go to the next slide. Yeah. I, it just it just said to me Poland, but 
Yeah. Oh, I see. This is the one you were talking about, Amanda. Yeah. The, the okay. way the crown is done, it's like in a because Polish Judaica has sometimes like a kind of simplistic style. So, yeah. So, but it, 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 it could absolutely hail from anywhere where this technique was done on, on uh, textiles in Europe uh, for the synagogue. It could really, anywhere. I guess that leads to my next question of, has there been, have you noticed, or I guess the answer is kind of no, of, a, a, of a country that seems to, or commonalities for certain countries, because you said in Austria, Hungary, it's kind of like this. Um, so it sounds like there isn't really any common traits between countries or regions. Yes. That might be why maybe you can hear me. You disappeared for a second, but I think you're back now. <laughs> Okay, a phone call came in. I didn't answer it. That's why. Do you, do you want me to re-say the question? I don't know if you heard no, it. No, no. Did, did you hear my answer? I'm sorry. Not at all. Nope. Go ahead. Say it oh. again. Uh, okay, sure. Uh, it could absolutely hail from anywhere. Oh, we heard it's that one. That... <laughs> oh. I asked another question. <laughs> oh, sure. I, that I didn't hear. Okay, cool. Um, so I said, it sounds like the answer is no, but have you noticed any common traits between countries or regions that this area tends to do a lot of this for their decorations or this area doesn't tend to do this in their area? So it sounds like there's no real common traits between regions or countries though. You're, are you specifically talking about metallic thread on velvet or anything? Just anything, anything. No. Oh. So it, it, it really depends. Um, for the pewter plates, that is really limited to Germany uh, and Bohemia and the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. Pewter plates for Passover or Purim or the Sabbath do not come from Poland, do not come from Hungary or Romania or um, or uh, Italy, pewter you know is, is? Generally, uh, is generally a German item. Do I know where that, I don't know why that is. It, it could be just local, local, local usage of pewter. Okay. I'm not exactly sure, but the vast majority, when I say vast, I'm talking 85% of pewter items that are Jewish, that are decorated for a holiday or for the Sabbath that appear on the, that are in museums or appear in the marketplace, uh, hail from Germany. And if not from Germany, hail from Bohemia, Moravia, or the Netherlands. You do not, I guess pewter was not used in the 18th and 19th century or, or as not decorated in the 18th and 19th century in, country, in countries like Poland or Hungary. You just don't see it. Got it. Cool. Thank you. Um, and uh, as, far as, as far as other materials, um, let's see. Ceramics and porcelain, you'll, it, it tends to be Germany, Austro-Hungarian Empire, Ukraine. Uh, silver, everybody wants silver. So silver is really everywhere. If you had the means to afford it, which most Jews didn't. Um, uh, what other, uh, brass, brass is very, very Poland and Ukraine centered. Whereas Hanukkah lamps in Germany would be made out of pewter, silver. Uh, you really see a proliferation of brass Jewish ceremonial objects like Hanukkah lamps in Poland and the Ukraine. I hope that answers some of your questions. Um, I have a, a question, speaking of materials, uh, Sadek, about this, um, this little wooden calendar scroll that you showed us. Um, and you said, sure. um, you said that in yeah, for the Omer. Yeah, for the, exactly. And, um, you said that in a particular region, I think it was Poland, uh, the things were typically made from, uh, fruit woods 
And yes. um, uh, this one was not, and that's one of the ways you could identify it as German. Um, yeah, and so, likely, likely German, likely, like, German. likely German. Um, so I'm curious about two things. One is whether you could talk about the significance of uh, fruit wood for, um, for carving wooden Judaica or just maybe wood carving in general uh, in particular regions. And also how did, sure. how did you identify the wood looking at this? I mean, what? Uh, okay. So to answer the first question, um, the largest forested area really where Jews resided in Europe was Ukraine. Ukraine has vast fields of forests. So an easy way to make a Jewish ceremonial object, if you don't have means, and as we all know, most Jews living in the Galician, Polish, Ukrainian area did not have means to make an item out of even brass. Even brass was considered a luxury material. Uh, is to go to the forest and get some wood and take it to a carver to, to carve it. And there is a lot of types of uh, fruit wood, uh, pear trees, for example, that grow in Poland and the Ukraine. And fruit wood is very, very soft. So it's very easy to carve. And so you'll see when you encounter Judaica that comes from these regions, it's usually of a, a lighter color and it's, it's, it's soft. This wood, as you can see, it's, it's rather dark in color and it's not so soft, it's kind of hard. And, I, and uh, in my experience with wooden Jewish objects, excuse me, Wooden Jewish objects, uh, I could tell this was not made out of fruit wood, which it, and the, this type of wood, it reminded me of, if anyone knows, uh, German Black Forest ware, uh, which is uh, the Black Forest region in Germany, uh, had a whole industry in and of itself of carved goods for the, for the German Christian public. And that would also tends to be on the darker side and and uh, harder. So where could this be from? Not Poland, not Ukraine, not Galicia. I, I you don't see uh, you don't see wooden Jewish objects coming from Hungary really or Romania or other countries in Europe. Maybe maybe Bohemia. Uh, Italian wood's a different story altogether. Um, doesn't apply woodwise. So, based on all that, based on the wood, my experience with wood, it, and it, it's probably Germany. But again, like with the matzah cover, I cannot defini definitively say for sure. Now, the second to the cover. Here we go. Yes. Okay. All right. Go ahead, Joyce, and, and tell us about this. So this belonged to my great uncle. He was born in St. Ingbert, Germany, which is the Saar region. And he emigrated to the United States in the late 1930s and then was in World War II. And it's a very cherished possession of mine. So I really, as I mentioned during the, the talk, Books are really not my area of expertise. I happen to know I'm familiar with this book, um, uh, this Haggadah, excuse me, because it's been issued so many times during the pre-war and post-war period, and even in different languages. I believe I've seen it besides in German, I've seen it in English, and I've seen it in French, and I think I've even seen it in Hungarian. Um, Obviously, the most coveted are pre-war print printed examples. Um, if you want to know a value, I know it's priceless as a, a family heirloom, but as long but it's very very common. Uh, really, it, it, it was apparently printed in tremendous numbers, as far as I know. Um, I believe the earliest print the printings are from the twenties. So it should so this if this is German, it should be anywhere from the 20s or 30s as a publication date. And I think the value on today's market, because th there's so many 
that were printed and so many have survived. Oh, it's oh, right there. It says uh, Vienna, 1927. Um, probably about $100, maybe 150 But again, this is not really my area. But I, I, I happen to have seen this Haggadah so many times over the years that I was, I've been familiar with it like through osmosis. So thank you very much for sharing them. Thank you. Again, it's just very sentimental. Thank you, Joyce. Um, of course. Artifact 2 is another Haggadah. Um, who is this? Who is this one from? Oh, and N.S. Bricker. Could we um, uh, unmute um, N.S. Bricker? And um, want to? Oh, okay. He says he needs to chat rather than speak. That's fine. Um, so uh, why don't you tell us in the chat a, a little bit about this Haggadah that you've sent in. All right, well, we can see that it is in, um, okay. His uncle who was in Polish, who was Polish, ended up in Munich. Was that in a, a DB camp? No, okay, I, I shouldn't assume. Okay, right, Af so after being released from a concentration camp, And it says, oh, it says this is some sort of anthology more than a, than a Haggadah. And you can see that on the cover, there's a burning book. Das, Pega, das Pergament verbrannte, aber die heilige Schrift schwang sich aufwärts. So the parchment burned. Hmm? Hello. Uh oh. Uh, well, let's take a let's take more of a look here. Okay. So I I happen to know this piece as well. Okay. Let's hear about it. So this was the uh, this was I believe printed by the Shiret Haplita in Germany right after the war, nineteen forty six, and. It was given out, I also believe, in displaced persons camps like the like the green Passover ceramic dish that I was the last slide in the uh, in the um, passages related to the Haggadah. And it's also quite common. Um, I've seen many examples over the years. Um, Value, if it's in fair condition, is also about $100. But all printed in tremendous numbers. And many, many have survived. Um, but as you can see, it's, it's really discussing, uh, emphasizing from the cover illustration of the burning books and the burning Torah scrolls about what happened to European Jewry uh, right before. But it's, it's it's for the first free Passover in Germany uh, during the war. I believe it's like it's called a Pesach book. So I'm not sure if it's a Haggadah or it's part or it's partially a Haggadah and, and also telling different episodes maybe of, of uh, European Jewry. But very very common. Uh, Renata Evers, our stories and essays. Renata Evers, our director of. Uh... Collections is online. Renata, do you, do you know anything about this book? Is this something that we have in the library? 
but specifically, I have to pass at this point. Oh, okay. Um, good. I think our next items, we have a few items from Joan Lessing. And Joan, I think I unmuted you. Um, you did. Yeah, so this Kiddush cup um, is the first one. That's from, that's from you, right? Yes. Okay. Um, why, why don't you tell us about uh, the objects that you've, you've sent in, maybe starting with this one? Well, what I've sent in is the Kiddush cups that I inherited from my parents, and some of them came from my grandparents. And this one came from my grandparents, but I don't know what the marks are on the bottom. So I'm not quite sure what the origin is. Hmm. Um, so I recognize this cup right away. It's going back to, I would say the late 17th century, 1690, there began a tradition in German uh, silversmiths to make cups with hearts on them. And this carried out through the 18th century and 19th century. And of course, many plain silver cups, uh, when I say plain, I mean undecorated with Hebrew for ritual use were still used by Jews in Germany for Sabbath Kiddush and holidays. So the heart motif, I know right away as it being a, a German silver cup. I can't make out the hallmark. I'm going to do something very strange and take a magnifying glass to the screen and see if I can make out the mark through the magnifying glass. Okay. So that, those characters, it's just two characters and it actually looks Cyrillic, which is very odd. I really, I can't, I, yeah. If it was I don't Cyrillic, see a that German would be mark. A, a G and an L, Russian, right? exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, they, they look Cyrillic. So actually, I mean, the marks are telling me the story. I mean, German silver is always marked with, with identifiably German marks. This, the city mark, the, uh, the number of the, for the silver content, this has none of that. This has just two Cyrillic letters. There's something in so the this center. Is a, yeah, that, that's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the engraved, the engraved letters above it, which I'm not even sure that's Cyrillic. Maybe it is, um, which could very well be the initials of the owner. But as a silver piece itself, even though it's a German design of hearts that I'm very familiar with, it has Cyrillic hallmarks. So maybe this is actually a Russian piece which adopted the heart motif. I'm not aware of Russian silver using this repeating heart motif, really only German silver. Um, if it was German, and it looks like it's, it's in, definitely in the style of German, it's very odd. You know what? <clears throat> because that band above the hearts, this is all constructed in a very Germanic way. Okay, I'm going to say two different things. If this is a Russian cup, which it could be, because that's what the, the mark is telling me, it's Cyrillic letters of the maker, then as an unusual Russian cup, not that I know just general Russian silver very well, I would think it has a value of at least five or $600. But... If this is a German cup where the base has been replaced, so the base was damaged at some point, and then someone took a base from a, 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 a similar sized vessel and put it on this cup, or maybe it was repaired in, a Russia, in Russia, and the, the maker put his hallmarks on it, then you have like a marriage piece. So it's a German cup with a replaced base. So if it was a German, so as if it was, a, if it's a German cup with the German marks, let's say the 19th century, it would have a value of maybe again, four, five, six hundred dollars with a replace. If it's a German cup with a replaced base, that really diminishes the value probably to a third. So this all, this has to be inspected 
in person to make a determination. The most value would be is if it's actually a Russian cup. If this is actually a Russian cup, it's very unusual because the repeating heart design is, you see really in German cups. So it's interesting. Thank right. you for sharing. So these are some more Kiddush yeah. cups, right? With so this yeah. is another typical German cup. And this one, you can see, I could see right away there are German marks on it. Let me just take out my magnifying glass up to my phone. So I can see two marks. So the zigzag line you see there, it's called an assay scrape, which was used in Germany uh, to, uh, to test the silver content, to make sure that, this, that the silver content matches what the legal uh, qualification should be to, to sell a silver cup. So that zigzag is a typical uh, German assay scrape. Then you have two marks. So one, the mark on the left, is it two or three? One second. I think it's two. Yeah, it's two. So the mark on the left looks like the monogram of the maker, which I don't know offhand. You would have to look in, into a, a German silver book. And the mark on the right is the city mark, and it's an, an acorn which I believe if my memory serves me right is for Augsburg, Germany, but I could be wrong, but I, I believe it's for Augsburg. Uh, that zigzag mark shows me that it's 18th century or earlier. Um, it, would, it all depends on identifying the mark of the, the maker. Uh, it's probably early 18th century. And these, these bald feet silver cups are very popular with collectors. And this probably has a value Again, not, not Judaica, even though it was used in a Jewish ritual purpose, but as a, as a German silver cup with no Hebrew writing, early 18th century, I would say a solid $1,000. Here's some more Kiddush cups. Okay. The, this one is part of a set. Nice. And the story behind it, I don't know whether you can read what it says on there. It says Gross Mama. Mm -hmm. my, oh. great, my great grandmother gave to my father each year, now hold your breath, for Christmas, a silver kiddush cup. And underneath, it was carefully marked Gross Mama, and then it said Weihnachten, and then the year. This one comes from 1928. That was the year that my father came home and first announced that he was going to be bar mitzvah. That started the first problem for various social reasons. Then he came home and said he was now a Zionist. So now we have a complete switch in the family because there is a Zionist child. He was an only child and he was a Zionist and he was going to be bar mitzvah and all the rest of it. And my grandparents actually did take him that year, 1928 to the Zionist Congress in Zurich, which I thought was good of them. But that was the year that all of a sudden it doesn't say Weihnachten anymore on the bottom of the cup. It says 25, 12, 28. So it's still a Christmas present, but it doesn't say so. Yeah, it, it was, they probably took it to a, a silversmith to erase the engraving of Weihnacht. Um, no, they, I think it was added. A beautiful cup. Uh, I really don't recall seeing one exactly like this before. But it's definitely. It's a set. There are several of them. I have a few. My sister has a few. I'm sorry, you were breaking up. I couldn't hear you. I'm sorry. It's part of a. That's part of a set. And my sister has some, and oh. I have some. Uh, uh huh. Uh, very beautiful. Probably a few hundred dollars. Well, we're not giving these up. Uh, that's for sure. Okay, this one comes out of the silver workshop of David Kugelman in Bad Kissingen. He was my maternal, 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 can one say that? My, um, my great grandfather. And he was an antiquaire and he also had a silver workshop and this is one of the pieces I have from there. 
most of the stuff that he did was not necessarily Jewish and can still be found in various places. So. Lovely again, um, but this is strictly a piece of silver. As a piece of uh, pre-war German silver, maybe five or six hundred dollars, maybe five hundred. This is the other Davy Kugelman. This is this is less this is less elaborate. Um, maybe uh, maybe two hundred two fifty. The one that I'm curious about, I don't know whether that's the next one. No, not that one. That's not, I don't think that's, what's the next one after that? No. Oh, Ice box. there's a, there's another one. Can you see this? Mm-hmm. Uh, let's see. Is that, is that one of the pictures that you sent us? I thought I did. Don't see that one. Maybe you could just hold it up to the uh, to the camera. I'm curious about this one because I saw one that was just restituted to a family, and they talked about the fact that it was hugely valuable. And this one is not. Oh, that's better. Can you see that? It was. This one is not as elaborate as that one was. I, I really, I can't make out the detail. Sorry. I think oh. Sadik is on a phone actually. So he probably sees yeah. a, a quite a tiny version, but it's, it's quite beautiful. I'm sorry. I thought I had photographed it. And there don't seem to be any markings on it anywhere. I, I, I can't even make it out. I'm sorry. I'm on okay. a phone. Okay, another, another time. Um, well, how about with the last two, we have our spice boxes. Um, we'll yeah, I didn't know whether you want to just wanted things just for Seder or, or whatever. You can move on to somebody else's things. Um, okay, well, I let's see if there are any more questions um, from the audience. Uh, you can Were those spice tablets from you, ma'am? Yes. Did you want to take oh, a look at those, Zadik? Absolutely. Now we're getting into Jewish objects. Okay. All right. Let's. Uh, I'm going to bring the slideshow back then for the spice boxes. Thank you, Joan, uh, for sharing all this with us. You're welcome. I, I mean, maybe you could uh, just for the for the people who may be on who don't know, explain a little bit about who your who your father was and also in relation to Leo Beck Institute. Oh, my father was um, one of the founders of the Leo Beck Institute. And he came from the city of Bamberg, which just made a trivia quiz as a matter of fact, but that's something else. The city of Bamberg, which is between Würzburg and Nuremberg for those people who don't know, and it's worth a visit. It's um, a charming city and they even have what seems to be a permanent sort of the Jewish, the, the former Jewish community of Bamberg, they have an exhibition in their historical museum, which is very worth going to in itself, but Bamberg is beautiful. Okay, I know nothing about these. Yeah, about so the that's box. a typical, that's a typical spice tower uh, with filigree. Uh, depending on the marks, it it's, could be from Germany. Actually, um, the more I'm looking at it, the more I recognize it. Actually, it is from Germany. I recognize the decoration on top. This dates to the very late 19th century. It looks to be all complete and original. The flag, everything looks good. Uh, this is this is about six hundred dollars today. Dates to about 1885. That's German. And this yeah. is a real, you got it. This is a real winner. This is a German silver spice tower, obviously. 
But what's great about it is it's done in the form of a Moorish styled synagogue. Now, Moorish styled synagogues were very popular in Germany and in Hungary, specifically Budapest, uh, during the late 19th century. And the fact that this spice box is actually made in the shape of a Moorish styled synagogue uh, is very, very attractive to, to collectors. And even the Stars of David on each corner, it actually mimics what one a very famous synagogue that was rebuilt after the war that was destroyed in Germany, where it also has turrets with Stars of David on it. Where is that? And what you're missing on the top is actually a little flag, but it's always missing. I've never, I, you rarely talk. When you examine it in person, you'll see a little, you'll see a little rough break. And that's where a little flag would have been. But regardless, 99% of the time the flag is broken off because on this model it was very easy to break off. There are marks on the base that should correlate to it being German. I, I know I'm very familiar with this model. Uh, this dates to about 1890, and the value is three to four thousand bucks. Jesus, because it's in the shape of a Moorish styled synagogue. It's really, really desirable. Um, great. Well, thank you. I think we're we're almost out of time. I'm going to let R. Gottlieb have the the last word. Um, he writes uh, in the chat, "What is on your wish list?" of Passover Judaica, Sadek, in terms of uh, collecting, what are you on the lookout for now that would be sort of special and isn't already in your collection? I gotta tell you, I've been collecting for 25 years and I've been very, very fortunate that not only, uh, it, I, I only wanted to buy a few things. I didn't even wanna be a collector, but it just, snowballed into buying more and more because I couldn't, I, I couldn't give up items that I liked. There's really nothing on my wish list. I don't mean to sound flippant or arrogant, but I, I now, but you're very welcome, uh, uh, David Barrett. Um, but uh, if I see an item that I if I have the funds, which is difficult, more difficult thanks to Corona, um, yeah. but I really have nothing on my wish list. I, 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 have, I have pieces that I never thought I'd ever get a chance to own that I'm so ecstatic that I have them. So it's a great question, but there's nothing for Pesach or otherwise, there's nothing on my wish list. But thank you for asking. Great. Well, um... I want to thank everyone for, for joining us and, and hanging in there with us, uh, bearing with uh, the technical difficulties um, and just for spending some, some time with us. I sincerely hope that uh, next year uh, we can do this, um, not in Jerusalem, but at the Center for Jewish History live and in person uh, and, ac and actually see one another. But uh, Leo Beck Institute is going to be um, doing more programs like this. Um, uh, next week, we'll be talking to a, uh, a German writer named Max Cholek, who's a very interesting figure. Um, and you can read about him in the New York Times from a few weeks ago. So I encourage everyone to go on lbi.org um, and see uh, what we're planning to do next and to follow us um, uh, on any of our social media accounts, but in particular on Facebook, we're, we're posting a lot um, and a, a lot of extra stuff now that um, we can't do live public programs. So um, again, thank you all so much for tuning in and thank you very much, uh, Zadik. I'm, I'm looking over at the corner of my screen as if I'm like making eye contact with you, but of course actually um, you're there. Uh, anyway, I, wishing everyone a, a happy Passover and thank you all very much for tuning in. Stay safe. Thank you. Okay, you too. Thank you, David. Thank you for everybody for coming. Yep, thanks. Bye. Thank you, Tzedek. Bye-bye. Thank you. <laughs>